Amen. What a way to start our service today with the testimony of our new sister in Christ. Did you hear her? Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and I know him. Della, my prayer for you for all the days of your life is written by Paul in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. In the New Living Translation, he writes this. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. And faith family, that's my prayer for all of us today. I've got to admit that I come before you today with fear and trembling and want to remind you of what is true any given Sunday in any of our venues and any of our preachers here at Park Cities, Lord willing, God has been preaching to us long before he's preaching through us and he still is. We have not perfected this. We have not achieved this. We have not figured this out. We are not masters. We are still in process learning and being formed more and more into the image of God's own son right along with you. It's true every Sunday, and it's certainly true today, as I was asked to preach about conflict, and I'm the first to tell you I've not mastered it, but I'm looking to my master to lead me forward. His name is Jesus. So as you know that I'm preaching on conflict, some of you are cringing already, and I get it. I'm with you. While others of you just scooted forward to the edge of your seats because this is the kind of stuff you've lived for right? It's fascinating to me. Rarely do I meet somebody who's apathetic towards conflict. We tend to love it or hate it when the reality is conflict is and always will be this side of heaven. It's just a part of life. Conflict is described as a collision, a clash, a disagreement. And when we encounter people, we come into contact with real people every day with different beliefs and different backgrounds. We are bound to enter into conflict. Conflict is a part of any good relationship and it's a part of any good story. That was rule number one of my creative writing class at Texas A&M. In fact, I felt like I came into conflict with my professor because I did not provide sufficient conflict in my stories for him. Even our happy Hallmark movies this time of year still contain conflict. Generally 10 minutes before the end of the movie, before the last commercial break. If you know, you know. If only conflict could be so predictable in our own lives. And what if it could? King Solomon is writing words of advice for his son on how to live a wise life. And conflict is a part of life. You can't control whether conflict hits your door. It will. But you can control what you do with it. And so we're going to be rooted in the book of Proverbs today. I encourage you to open up your scriptures, but I also encourage you to take notes because I'm going to have our scriptures from Proverbs on the screen from you, for you as I'm reading from the New Living Translation. But I'm also going to reference a whole lot more scripture today that will not be on the screen. So I encourage you to listen and take note of those references. Why? Because they're words of life. And I invite you to sit in them with me this week as God teaches us how to navigate conflict. See, today's message is not about avoiding conflict, nor is it about pursuing conflict, but how to navigate conflict in such a way that honors God and blesses People, today's message is less about conflict and more about practicing patience and self-control in the face of conflict. That doesn't sound as cool. (laughs) So we're going to be in Proverbs starting in chapter 26, if you want to turn there with me. I'll be reading from verse 17 in Proverbs 26. It says this, interfering in someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking a dog's ears. Interfering in someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking a dog's ears. What is he saying? He's saying if you're walking along and you see a dog and you go up and pull its ears, what do you think is going to happen? Chances are you're going to get bit. In the same way, if you're going along and a couple of people are arguing, they're in a disagreement, they're in a collision, a clash, this conflict, and you jump in, you intervene, what do you think is going to happen? 
chances are you're going to get bit. Now, when I read this at first glance, I thought this meant that I should be avoiding intervening in other people's conflicts. It reads that way, doesn't it? But I wrestled with that knowing I was coming before you today because I thought as people of God who are living the kingdom of God here on earth as a foretaste of what's to come, God has called us to step into conflicts that may not be our own. Jesus is the picture of that. We were in conflict with sin and death and we could not win and Jesus came and overcame sin and death for us. Praise him. So as followers of Jesus, sometimes we're called to do the same. And so I was meeting with Travis leading up to this sermon because he's preaching in the great hall while I'm here, so we learn together. And I thank God for the spirit of God in him that illuminates God's word of truth as the spirit does for all of us. We're better together. And he said, it's not saying that you don't do it. He's saying what will happen when you do. Like, don't be surprised if you get bit because some things are worth getting bit over. I know this is true because I look at the life of Corrie ten Boom. I used to live in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I did university ministry there. And one day I got to take a nine minute train ride from Amsterdam Central Station to Harlem, not New York, the Netherlands. If you're ever there, I highly recommend this. And I had the joy and privilege of getting to tour Corrie ten Boom's home and standing in what perhaps some of you have stood in, the small hiding space, the hiding place. Corey was a follower of Jesus who lived in the Netherlands when the Nazis came to power. And she saw obvious injustice against Jews who were literally being taken on train tracks to their death. And she couldn't let it just go by. She had to jump in as any child of God should. She intervened and she was successful. She saved the lives of so many Jews who hid in this tiny hiding place behind her closet. But she got bit. She was taken to a concentration camp where her sister died and she survived and experienced God's grace. And if Corey were here today, I am sure that she would say that some things are worth getting bit over. And that certainly was. Park Cities, before I even knew you, I knew your reputation for seeking racial equity. Do you know that's part of why I'm here? A huge reason. I wanted to be a part of a church that was committed to bringing reconciliation across cultures, languages, genders, across the board. That we are one in the name of Jesus. I'm thankful that some things are worth getting bit over. If you'll continue with me in Proverbs chapter 26, we're going to move a couple of verses ahead to verses 20 and 21. It says, fire goes out without wood, and quarrels disappear when gossip stops. A quarrelsome person starts fights as easily as hot embers light charcoal, or fire lights wood. Fire goes out without wood. What is it saying? Listen, anytime we make a fire, we know that you have to keep feeding it for it to keep burning. If we stop fueling the fire, eventually it's going to die out. In the same way, the Proverbs tell us, conflict is associated with fire. And if we keep feeding it, if we keep fueling it, it's going to keep burning and growing. But if we cut it off, it will eventually die out. It says gossip, talking about it. Just recently, I was going through a conflict earlier this month that was hurtful. It was confusing. It was weighing heavy on me. And there's a place for venting. I get it. Get that out certainly to God. And maybe somebody trusted in your life who you can share the whole truth with, whether that's a counselor, a family member, a friend. And so I was going to my trusted person, telling them about this conflict that was weighing heavy on my heart, getting it out. And that's fine. But here's what happened. I ended up encountering multiple family members throughout the week in different ways that I did not plan on. And because they loved me, they wanted to know how I was doing and what I was carrying. And so I continued to rehearse and replay that conflict over and over again. Can you imagine what happened? It grew quite larger than it was originally. 
It became this huge, massive fire that was just overwhelming. I didn't know my way through. I thought about it all the time. When we fixate on these things, when we talk them over and over with people, they're going to keep burning. My question for you is this. It's one question, and if you hear anything from me today, I pray it's this. Which fires are we fueling? Which fires are we fueling? Are we fueling the fires of conflict? Or are we fueling the fire of faith? Because here, fire is used to describe conflict. But if you've been in the word of God, then you know fire is used on many other occasions to describe a whole lot more than conflict. In fact, it's used to talk about God. Hebrews 12 says that our God is a consuming fire. In Exodus chapter 3, God speaks to Moses from a burning bush. In Zechariah chapter 2, God is speaking about the city of Jerusalem. But we can apply it to ourselves as people of God today. When he says, and I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord. And I will be the glory in her midst. In Jeremiah 20, the prophet says, The word of God is like a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. In Acts chapter 2, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls on the people of God in the form of flaming tongues of fire. And the New Testament is packed with these pictures of the good news of Jesus spreading like wildfire. Our God is like a fire. We talk about people who love Jesus, who trust Jesus, as people who are on fire for Jesus. Don't you know? Which fire are we fueling? The fires of conflict or the fire of our faith? I pray it would be the latter. Another example of fire is in James chapter 3, which will not be on your screens, but I pray that you would hear it and you would sit in it with me this week. I'm turning with you, so it's okay to take some time. There we go. James chapter 3. Last week, Travis was in this room and he preached on words, the power of our words. Next week, we'll hear a sermon on anger and conflict is right in the middle, right as it should be. You should see a continuing thread between our sermons throughout the book of Proverbs and about wisdom because it's all interconnected, isn't it? And so Travis said himself that so often our conflicts come from our words with one another. So true. And James has a lot to say about that in chapter 3, starting in verse 2. I want you to specifically listen for that word fire. He says, indeed, we all make many mistakes. Thank you, James. I needed that. Anyone else? Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, The tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison, sometimes It praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who've been made in the image of God. And so, blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. 
Surely this is not right. James is writing this in verse 1 of chapter 3. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. It's interesting to me that sometimes the greatest gifts of God in our lives are also our greatest weaknesses. And I think it's designed that way, to keep us dependent on God, that he would use what he's entrusted to us for his glory rather than our own gain. Left to our own devices, we make quite a mess of things. But God can make very glorious things out of us if we would trust him, if we would submit to him. I'm thankful James doesn't beat around the bush. He tells us like it is, and it can sound pretty harsh, but I don't think there's a single one of us who would disagree with him. That blessing and cursing can come out of the same mouth. Surely this is not right. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. If we could control our tongues, we could control everything about ourselves and be perfect. He says, no one can tame the tongue. Amen. But there is a perfect one. Isn't there? His name is Jesus. And he has the power to do what none of us can. And I'm grateful for the good news in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 22. That though we cannot exhibit patience and self-control in the face of conflict on our own, the good news is that we don't have to. You see, we have good news that they didn't have in Proverbs. Solomon didn't have. It's the whole reason I'm standing before you today. Not because I was asked to, not because it's part of my job. No, the reason I'm standing before you today is because I believe there is good news in Jesus. I believe he's given us the gift of his Holy Spirit, and I exist to declare that. Nothing more and nothing less. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 says, but the Holy Spirit, who? The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And do you hear it? Self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. In every part of our lives. Listen, as you're hearing this message about conflict in all of our sermons throughout Proverbs, it should feel overwhelming. You should feel like you don't quite measure up because you don't. And it is. These proverbs point us to Jesus, our desperate need for Jesus, the perfect one, our good news, who gave us his Holy Spirit to produce in us what we cannot manufacture on our own, and we are exhausted every time we try to do so. Anyone else? Indeed, we make many mistakes. Praise God for his spirit in us. And do you notice it says that we have nailed the passions and desires of our sinful nature to the cross of Christ. We have crucified them there. My question is, have we? Listen, it's totally natural. And I'm preaching to myself, I want you to know, it's totally natural for us to want to retaliate. It's totally natural for us to want to continue to build up and feed and fuel these fires of conflict in our lives. It is supernatural for us to practice patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control in the face of conflict. It's supernatural. We need God to help us do it. And he is glad to do so. Would we nail the passions and desires of our flesh to the cross of Christ and crucify them there? Will we just let them die out? Stop fueling these fires of conflict. Friends, fuel the fires of faith with me, will you, please? We need each other. So back to Proverbs. We're going to be in chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. It will be on the screen for you. We'll be in verse 11. It says, Sensible people control their temper. They earn respect by overlooking wrongs. Then IV says, A man's wisdom gives him patience. It's to his glory to overlook an offense. Why? Is it to our glory to overlook offenses? Why do we earn respect by overlooking wrongs? Could it be that it's because that's what God does, doesn't he? Our God, who has every single right 
to hold every single one of our wrongs against us. Instead, while we were living as his enemies, living as though we hated him, God demonstrates his own love for us by sending his own son Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners, living as sinners. He called us friends while we were living as enemies. God came and sent his son to carry all of our offenses, all of the ways we wronged him, past, present, and future, so that we could be his forever. God showed mercy to us. So when we show mercy to others, it is to our glory. It is respectable. Because heaven knows it's not natural. It is supernatural. So that shows somebody surrender to the leading of the Spirit in their lives if they can show mercy in the face of conflict. Y'all know that's not natural. So you see, in the kingdom of God, when it comes to conflict, the one who shows mercy is the one who actually wins. So contrary to what we understand in our world, isn't it? To show mercy in the face of conflict. You know, we just read together earlier in the responsive reading that Nathan led through scripture. We said it with our own mouths. Do you remember that Jesus says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That's hard, Jesus. It's supposed to be. We need him to do it. One of the greatest conflicts I went through as a teenager, some of you have been through this, was I was dating a guy who cheated on me. And y'all, I was mad, I was sad, I was feeling all the things. And I remember in the middle of my pain and frustration, I went to one of my youth pastors at church. So side note, if you're serving amongst the next generation, I wanna say thank you, because what you are doing matters. And they may never tell you thank you to your face, but I can promise you that what you are doing matters. Because when my boyfriend cheated on me, and I was in great pain and frustration, I went to church and I asked one of my youth pastors what to do, because I said, listen, I know that God is about forgiveness, and so I should forgive them, but I just don't know how. And thank God one of my youth pastors said, Have you tried praying for them? It's really hard not to forgive somebody if you're praying for them. Well, no, of course I had not. I mean, who naturally thinks that? So thank goodness for people who serve the next generation with a wisdom they have learned throughout the years. Who knows, maybe they were cheated on, I don't know their story. But I started praying for them and wouldn't you know, I was able to forgive them. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. You can show mercy when you take it to God. But we don't take it to God, do we? Oh, we stew over it. I'm gonna speak to my fellow perfectionists in the room because I know I'm not alone. As we expect perfection, not only of God and of others, but also of ourselves. And so when I am in the wrong, my family's here to attest to this, I cannot get over it. I stew over it. I think about it. And I'm so frustrated with myself and how I've fallen short. And so when he says it's to our glory to overlook offenses and wrongs, it's not only the wrongs of others, it's also our own. Now hear me, yes, there's a place for recognizing our shortcomings, confessing our sins to God who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us. But there's a difference between confession and repentance and what it is that I find myself often doing, punishing myself for something that's already been paid for. You see, it's not that it doesn't matter. It's that it's already been paid in full by Jesus so that we could be free in him, not because of what we've done that was good enough, but because of what he's done that is enough. He said it was finished at the cross. Why do we keep bringing it up again? We're supposed to nail that to his cross. Let it be crucified there with him. Be raised to new life in him. Why is it so hard? So we need to overlook not only the wrongs of others, but also our own wrongs. And only you know which one of those is harder to do, but I can promise you both require the Holy Spirit. Recently, our pastor Jeff was preaching from Galatians chapter five, when Paul writes, If you keep in step with the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. 
Do you hear? That's a promise, not a command. That was a huge deal for me to learn with you just recently. If we keep in step with the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of our flesh. That's language of walking. And so I want to encourage you today, in the face of conflict, keep walking. We want to sit there and make a big bonfire out of it. But God has called us to keep walking. Come and follow me. Keep in step with the Spirit. You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And even in the definition of repentance is walking. It is turning and walking in a new direction. Keep on walking. It's paid for. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit and follow his leading in every part of our lives. The last scripture I'm going to read from Proverbs is in chapter 16, verse 32. I love this one. Solomon says, better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. Better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. Who is saying this? The king, Solomon, most powerful, is saying to his son, son, more than the power people ascribe you because of your position is your ability to be patient. Kings who are known for conquering said, son, better than your desire to possess lands is your ability to possess self-control. Do we hear it? Power looks a lot different in the kingdom of God. In fact, it looks a lot like Jesus. When we look at him, who's given us the spirit. Second Timothy 1, 7, he says that we have not received a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of what? Power, love, and self-control. What if the conflicts that we encounter actually lead us to seek God more as we don't know how to navigate them. You see, we encounter conflicts, we're always surprised, but they're always there. But what I do often, and I don't think I'm the only one, is when I encounter conflicts, I associate all these smaller fires with it and it becomes this huge overwhelming thing. And I don't know the way forward. And I thank God he gave us a story in his word where he stands with us in the fire. Do you know it? He's our way forward. He knew. He knew that we would face conflict, trial, sorrow in this world. But we can take heart because he's overcome it for us. It's overwhelming on our own. It always will be. So let's not fixate on the fires of conflict. Let's fixate on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, you hear the example he's setting for us, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of our Father. That's our Savior, that's our Lord, that's our guide who gave us his own spirit to guide us, to comfort us, to show us when we're supposed to step in and when we're supposed to step back, when we're supposed to speak up and when we're supposed to stay quiet on our own. We can't figure it out. We need him. We need his word and we need one another. This week I had the privilege of participating in the Right Now Media Pastors and Church Leaders Conference and I got to hear from a number of gifted proclaimers of God's word, including Jen Wilkin. And she had something to say about wisdom that I wanted to pass on to you as we are in this series about ancient wisdom for modern times. She said this, wisdom is not knowing what to do. It's taking what I have and making the best decision available to me. Knowing what to do is knowledge. We ask God for wisdom when we're really asking for knowledge. God tells us to ask for wisdom and he will give it to us. Wisdom is not knowing what to do, it's taking what I have and making the best decision available to me. Friends, what do we have? The 
fullness of God who chooses to live within us, knowing all of our shortcomings, all of our failures, every one of our evil, selfish desires he knows, and he chooses to inhabit us, to love us, no matter what. Growing up, my family would always tell me, and they'll still do it, let it go, let it go, let it go. I need to learn some lessons from Elsa because it doesn't come natural to me. How do I let go of something that is all-consuming? I take hold of my all-consuming God, for our God is a consuming fire. He is a devouring fire. He is more than enough. We can focus on the greater light who shines in the darkness and the darkness will never extinguish it. So we can fuel the fires of conflict or we can fuel the fires of our faith in conversation with God, in study of his word, and would you know, in relationship with one another. Because God has not only given us his spirit, he has given us a new family. Stronger than the bonds of any family relationship is the bonds of the Holy Spirit who binds us together. We need each other to remember what's true. We can't do it on our own and we were never supposed to. I'll close with this. Last week I got to visit one of our thread groups in town. Women of all ages who meet weekly to grow together, learning from the stories of women in the scriptures and seeing her story as our story and how we can better live into God's greater story together. And there was a young woman who came into the group last week weighed down for days because of something hurtful someone had said to her. And she needed to get it out. She did briefly. But here's what was beautiful. I saw women of all ages, I didn't need to say a word, I just witnessed it. I saw women of all ages step in and tell her what's true about God, herself, her situation, pray for her, point her to the word of God. And this girl who came in weighed down by the weight of lies spoken over her, walked out free in the name of Jesus, on fire for Jesus, believing what's true of Jesus. Why? Because of his word, because of prayer, and because of his people. Are you living into what's available to you? I'm asking that of myself. Are we living into our relationship with God in prayer? Are we living into God's word for us, what's true in his word? And are we living into the family he's given us that we truly are better together? Friends, we are not alone in our conflict. God is with us in our conflict just as much as he is with us outside of it. But somehow I find I seek him more in it and I come out more in love with him than when I walked in. Is that true for you too? Which fire are you fueling? Lord, may you help us fuel the fires of our faith over and above the fires of conflict. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your family. I thank you for your sacrifice that you stepped into our conflict for us carried the weight of it for us so that we could walk free in you, forgiven by you. May we not focus on avoiding conflict or pursuing it, but learning how to navigate it in such a way that honors you and blesses people. And God, we need you to be able to do that. Grant us wisdom. You want to, we're asking. Help us to believe that you fight for us. We need only be still. Amen.